Uh, our speaker today is uh, Professor Rosinka Chaudhary, uh, who is a professor and director at the very famous Center for Studies in Social Sciences in Calcutta. Um, Professor Chaudhary has got eight books. She's written eight books, written, edited, and translated. In, 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 in a few, in a matter of a few years. Uh, I'm not going to read the names of all of them. And uh, the last book, uh, the last two that I have here, is uh, the, lit the literary thing, History, Poetry, and the Making of Modern Literary Culture, which was 2013 and 2016. They're the history of Indian poetry in English. Uh, she's also translated uh, the complete text of the letters of Tagore, and uh, who, who wrote his niece Indra Devi, uh, Letters from a Young Poet uh, in 2014, and she's published widely. Um, today she's going to talk about a very interesting topic, large cabbages and fine blue indigo. <laughs> Debating Free Trade and Colonization in Calcutta. Professor George. Thanks. Okay. Okay, I'm going to be very old fashioned and just read. I hope that holds your attention. I find uh, images tend to keep people awake and <laughs> it's very useful uh, uh, for that reason alone, if not. Uh, so other more valid reasons for using images. So I'll I'll read and hopefully as I read, um, what I'm going to speak about will become clear. Um, if it doesn't, we'll uh, discuss this after the paper because it is a truncated version from a larger to, to fit into the time constraints uh, today. So if I've been too elliptical in ruthlessly editing out parts that should have been there in order to explain context, then uh, do ask and I'll uh, sort of address those later. So yes, this is called Large Cabbages and Fine Blue Indigo, um, which is supposed to be in quotation marks, actually. It's uh, not my phrase. Um, debating Free Trade and Colonization in Calcutta, 1829. So, if we attempt to return to the scene of excitement that comprised the topic labeled on the colonization of India in the newspapers and journals of 1829, one of the routes to take would be through the scene of debates on the specific issue called the Bengal Renaissance and the role played by Ramun Roy in those debates. Let me start by saying straight away that this paper does not have that purpose. Neither will I attempt here to analyze the scene as it presented itself in 1829 in the light of such larger abstractions as equality of subjects or early modern anti-absolutist formations, categories put in place by Partho Chatterjee in, black, in the Black Hole of Empire with regard um, to this era of British colonial rule in India. Instead, I would like to attempt, if not a systematic analysis and explanation of the different interests which, while upholding a basic faith in the desirability of British rule, uh, were ranged in this period in the form of alliances, perhaps shifting for and against company monopoly and company rule. Um, I would like at least a greater insight, uh, to present greater insight into the different constituencies that shaped political and commercial ideology in this region at this time. In doing so, I'll use archival material not used before in the form of speeches, reports, and debates in the press that should perhaps have implications for the historiography of free trade and the intellectual history of the empire of the early 19th century. Historians such as Shudipto Shen, Andrew Sartori, or Uday Mehta have used the site of early 19th century Bengal to track the different colonial, global, or liberal networks of the early 19th century. But the colonial context itself is ultimately, it seems to me at least, always just a setting for the exploration and elaboration of British imperial intellectual history. Whether agrarian capitalism, free trade, or utilitarianism. There is also by now a growing body of scholarship, as in Lynn uh, Zastopil's work, that is attempting to place metropolitan and colonial history in a single analytic frame, showing how players such as Ramon Roy impacted not just colonial India, but Victorian England as well. 
The perspective almost always, however, whatever the thrust of the research, turns the arena or the local scene as it played out in India itself very much into a setting or stage set, looked at from the vantage point of debates in parliament or the writings of British thinkers or imperial networks. It seems that today the site of enactment of policies of free trade, liberalism, imperialism or British colonial rule is perpetually in abeyance. It is out there. Like Saeed's Orient, it existed but that has rarely been of primary interest to the historian or the scholar studying these subjects, despite well-meaning projects such as Bailey's on the great Indian liberal tradition. What is being attempted here, rather, is a local approach, not as a way to reclaim an alternative perspective that emphasizes the local and ever receding category in itself. Rather, the question being asked is whether it is possible to look at history as it happened in Calcutta in 1829 in a stand-alone fashion, without constructing overarching categories to structure and explain it in an organized teleological linearity of narrative and form, as is demanded so often by both writers and reviewers of historical studies. One could speculate that perhaps an unintended consequence of making such an argument is to suggest that neither imperialism nor nationalism was hegemonic. Such a truth would appear to be self-evident. While marking a shift from histories of Bengal and India and South Asia more generally that place historical explanations and contexts within a framing of global histories and imperial histories, thus emphasizing the significance of connected histories in the making of the modern world, the approach here, nevertheless, does not sit entirely comfortably with histories written by figures on the left either, the subaltern studies historians, for instance, primarily because this is not an attempt to do history from below, an impossibility with regard to the colonization of India debates. Focusing tightly here instead on this issue of colonization alone, this paper will investigate whether a further excavation of the archive allows us instead to study this moment in history in itself, in as much as any interpretation of past events allows us to reconstruct a moment in time. In the process, I read the newspaper archives to bring in other sections in the debate comprising the local scene. Missionaries, zamindars, merchants, tradesmen and, unexpectedly, students who would later be called Young Bengal. Studying the argument to see what it looked like from Calcutta to its citizens, rather than relying on the parliamentary papers, select committee papers or the correspondence or depositions of governor generals or other British officials on the issue. Importantly, there's no claim made here of providing a counter to meta-narratives of radical versus conservative forces at play. As the arguments and supporting materials used here will show, it is in fact impossible both to separate out the radical from the conservative, a point made often enough before, as well as, as, well as to provide a purely local understanding of a debate that was essentially global in nature. It was global both in its implications, since it addressed the issue of a global colonial system, as well as in the very language and claims being made with reference to continents and countries across the globe. Further, the debates at issue here were circulating continuously between the two local spheres of Calcutta and London in a manner impossible to describe as subscribing in any way to the idea of the local as we ordinarily understand it. At the same time, the arguments were inflected with inputs from Serampur in the case of Calcutta, of the Calcutta local sphere, and the northern cities of Glasgow, Liverpool and Manchester in the case of London. So, while attempting to stress the local, I would still insist that no simple definition of the local would suffice in such a context, and the category, ca and the category would need to be stretched perhaps beyond endurance, to accommodate and argue for a locally inflected understanding of a global colonial debate instead. The first section is titled Meetings. The East India Company's charter, as I'm sure everybody in this room knows, was renewed twice in the first half of the 19th century, once in 1813 and again in 1833. Both times, sweeping changes were made, affecting the monopoly held by the company, fundamentally transforming the nature of Britain's trade with India. 
These were agitated times, but nothing in comparison to the tumult that followed, as between 1830 and 34, all of the leading Calcutta agency houses crashed, swept away, as Anthony Webster points out, in the worst financial crisis in living memory, bringing bankruptcy and destitution for many Europeans and Indians who had deposited their life savings in the houses. British India was plunged into deep economic depression. The firm whose failure in 1830 precipitated the wholesale collapse of the system was John Palmer and Company. And revelations of that firm's mismanagement contributed greatly to the subsequent collapse of other Calcutta firms, which all went under by the end of 1834, falling like a proverbial deck of cards. The problems of partner disloyalty and bad debt that brought down Palmer and Company were probably endemic and historians have pointed not just to the investment decisions taken by these agency houses but also to the appetite of leading agency house partners for high living with historians D.M. Piers and Omyo Kumar Bakchi blaming the failures on the sheer greed of individual agency house partners. Ironically, it was the very same John Palmer of Palmer and Company, the first large agency house to come crashing down in 1830, who chaired the huge Calcutta meeting of December 15, 1829, on behalf of the colonization of India. The Bengal Hurkaru had been excited about this meeting for some time preceding it, as they repeatedly announced the event in their editorial columns. I quote, The approach of one of the most remarkable and important public meetings which will have ever taken place in Calcutta is how they described it the week before, publishing speeches such as that of Lord Grenville's on the last renewal of the company's charter and following the course of the meeting throughout. <laughs> The effect of a petition in favor of colonization from the inhabitants of Calcutta, the Bengal Hurkaru felt, would, quote, be greater than the effect of all the petitions with which the table of the House of Commons will be loaded from all parts of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Berwick upon Tweed. The parliamentarian who would present such a petition from Calcutta to the House of Commons would be listened to as the representative of India, concerned with <coughs> again, quote, declaring the evils from which its inhabitants have suffered and bearer of the testimony of the inhabitants of Calcutta, who have, it said, unlike the Irish, not followed up their demands with perseverance and importunity. On December 3rd, 1829, the editorial announced, we have great pleasure in publishing today a requisition from the British merchants and others, inhabitants of Calcutta, to the High Sheriff, requesting him to convene a meeting for the purpose of petitioning Parliament to throw open the China and India trade and to provide on the expiration of the existing charter of the East India Company for the unfettered application of British skill, capital and industry to the commercial and agricultural resources of India. While the China and India trade was rarely referred to as the opium trade, the unfettered application of British skill, capital and industry was a phrase that would recur as discussion progressed. Further, the Bengal Hurkaru felt that trade here should be free to all subjects of the crown under a good and equal system of the laws and of judicial process, the person and property of every man being respected whether he be of this or that colour or country. All progress must remain stationary, felt the paper, until the colonization of India had been achieved. And in resuming their abstract of Lord Grenville's speech on India affairs, they venture to tell us what they mean by colonization. The colonization of India, it specified, meant, and I'm quoting, permitting to this country the free resort of intelligent Englishmen, always that qualification, um, with the right of exerting their abilities and investing their capital, how and in whatsoever manner they chose, subject only to wholesome laws. The British Zamindar, if such a thing were allowed to come into existence, the Bengal Hurkaru is confident to assert, would give the native his full percentage due to him and still secure to himself an ample and honourable recompense. This win-win situation would not only increase the resources and happiness of the millions of our fellow subjects, it would also augment to an astonishing degree the commerce of the British nation at, in general." Unquote. This in essence is the proposal that Ramon Roy, followed by Darukunath Tagore, stood up to support on the day of the meeting itself. 
The meeting took place on 15th December 1829 at 11 o'clock at the Calcutta Town Hall and the Bengal Hurkaru hoped the previous day that it would be numerously and respectably attended by all intelligent persons again of our mixed population, whether usually resident in the city or in the Mufasil, for the objects in view are general and common to all classes. The East India Company, of course, would be opposed to such a meeting, the editorial conceded, as it attacked the company in the language of the impeachment of Warren Hastings, alluding to them as obstinate and guilty committers of daily crime and misdemeanor. The meeting at 11 o'clock was announced both in the edit pages as well as by printing the notice issued by the sheriff on the front page alongside the advertisements and other notices that daily appeared there. The following day, 16th December, the lead editorial announced its satisfaction at the full meeting at the town hall yesterday, where the numbers present far exceeded our most sanguine hopes. Independent two of the numbers we do not recollect ever to have witnessed, it continued, a more unanimous or spirited expression of satisfaction than was displayed as the objects of the meeting were unfolded and seldom have louder cheers echoed through the hall than followed the reading of the resolutions and the observations made relative to them by the several movers and seconders. The meeting began with the first resolution being moved by Mr. John Smith and Darukanath Tagore, the Bengal Hurkaru reported, in moving the fifth resolution, pointed out how the wealth of the zamindars had increased from the establishment of the indigo factories, enabling the proprietors not only to pay the government revenue but to secure a considerable surplus to themselves. We then have an account of Ramon Roy's limited participation in this event. As it is reported, I thought quite curiously that, quote, in this statement he was confirmed by Ramon Roy, who was unfortunately laboring under indisposition and therefore incapable of delivering his sentiments so fully as he or we are sure the meeting could have wished. A full and more detailed report was published on December 17th when Darukanath's full speech was printed, in which he said he found that, quote, and these are Darukanath's own words, the cultivation of indigo and the residents of Europeans have considerably benefited the country and the community at large. The zamindars becoming wealthy and prosperous, the riots, which is a word for the Indian peasant, but not exactly. Um, I can explain later. The riots materially improved in their condition and possessing many more comforts than the generality of my countrymen where indigo cultivation and manufacture is not carried on. The value of land in the vicinity to be considerably enhanced and cultivation rapidly progressing. He insists that these observations are made from personal observation and experience, both with the places as well as with the character and manner of the indigo planters. We note that he takes care to add here very briefly, that, quote, there may be a few exceptions as regards the general conduct of indigo planters, but they are extremely limited and, comparatively speaking, of the most trifling importance, unquote. As we know, of course, 30 years later, um, by 1860, the Bengal countryside would explode with what came to be called the uh, Blue Mutiny or the indigo revolts um, on the issue of planter oppression. Darukanath then goes on to cite an instance in support of his statement, mentioning a particular estate that was unprofitable before, but which, within a few years of the introduction of indigo, gives me a handsome profit. Several of my relations and friends too, he asserts, have in like manner improved their property and are receiving a large income from their estates. If so much benefit may be derived in this one instance alone, he wonders, sounding more and more like the true capitalist that he was, what further advantages may not be anticipated from the unrestricted application of British skill and capital and industry to the very many articles which, which this country is capable of producing to as great an extent and of as excellent a quality as any other in the world, and which of course cannot be expected to be produced without the free recourse of Europeans. On these grounds, then, the fifth resolution of the petition was moved by Darukanath to go and seconded by Prashundanath, spelt in the paper as Prasanet to go. Of Ramon Roy, curiously, no more than a couple of sentences may be found in the pages upon pages of this longer report as well. No doubt because, as we've seen, he was meant to be indisposed that day. The sum total of his involvement in the meeting just occupies a single paragraph in, in the Hurkaru. 
This is what it said. Ramohan Roy supported the resolution and said, from personal experience, I am impressed with the conviction that the greater our intercourse with European gentlemen, the greater will be our improvement in literary, social and political affairs, a fact which can, easily, which can be easily proved by comparing the condition of those of my countrymen who have enjoyed this advantage with that of those who unfortunately have not had that opportunity, and a fact which I could, to the best of my belief, declare on solemn oath before any assembly. I fully agree with Darukhanath Tagore in the purport of the resolution just read. So the generality of his response here could not be plainer. He's impressed, he says, with the conviction that the more we mix with the Europeans, the more we may improve in the arts and sciences, in society and in politics. This much he's already said before um, in writing, for instance, in his famous letter on education to Lord Amherst in 1823. The only fact he swears on to this assembly is one he would be prepared to stand by before any group of people, that those Indians who had mingled with Europeans were better off than those who had not. Finally, a nod in the direction of friend Darukanath, asserting that he is in full agreement. While both were involved in collaborations with business ventures of private trading and agency houses, I think we can agree that Ramhun's faint presence here needs re-evaluation, throwing some doubt upon how fully he stood behind his younger contemporary and friend on this issue. And the reason, and I'm not going to go into an entire explanation over here, but the reason why Ramon Roy's involvement in this particular meeting and then later as well in the replies he gave to the uh, sort of, um, uh, to the parliament um, in, in a, when he was in England in 1831-32, uh, uh, um, were to do with how fully he actually stood behind the cause of the Indian riot or peasant um, in this period. Um, what happens as a consequence of um, some left historians rereading of Ramun Roy's participation in this meeting and then later on in his uh, judicial replies um, is that basically the entire category of the Bengal Renaissance gets um, uh, dismantled. Uh, so the three historians are Ashok Shen, Borunde, and Shumit Sharkar, and they write three individual essays in a volume edited by V.C. Joshi called Ramun Roy and the Process of Modernization in India, and in that they basically dispute, they use this Bengal Hurkaru material and they basically dispute the fact that Ramun Roy was ever in, on the side of the peasants and that leads on to a, 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 a re-evaluation of, if you remember Shumit Sharkar's whole uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, essay argued that uh, the, the extent and scope of the Renaissance was therefore a limited one and therefore, uh, you know, it wasn't really, uh, shouldn't really be uh, termed a Renaissance at all. So, so um, all of that actually, um, happens subsequently because of the way that those historians read this particular moment in history. So I'm not going into, into all of that over here and sticking with uh, my uh, concerns. With which we come to the second section, debates. The debates surrounding what was called the colonization, colonization of India by which is meant, we now understand, the right of Europeans to settle in India were of course fiercely fought at the time. On the one side were the authorities, representatives of the East India Company and the extremely Tory John Bull, with whom the Bengal Hurkaru in the India Gazette are constantly skirmishing in their editorial pages, calling it in one instance, quote, the solitary and shameless advocate of monopoly in trade and despotism in government. On the other side were the supporters of free trade, the India Gazette, the Hurkaru, its brother radical. Um, both of these, uh, 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 the Hurkaru especially actually, the Hurkaru later incorporates the India Gazette, uh, Hurkaru gains in strength over the 1840s, um, incorporating the India Gazette in its fold by then. Strongly Whiggish in its politics, the proprietor from 1821 onward was Samuel Smith. And although the Bengal Hurkaru is ascribed as being almost of the radical party, we must remember that this ascription applied to English politics, of course. Now, again, this needs, perhaps needs further elaboration, but this equation bet between um, uh, uh, sort of shattering the monopoly of the East India Company and despotism in government. The, what is the phrase he uses? Um, shameless advocate of uh, monopoly in trade and despotism in government. This, this linking together of these two things is what I think creates the confusion in the first place because while um, uh, uh, shattering the monopoly in trade was one thing entirely, despotism in government, if it as understood um, in the context of the settling debate, that is of, of the British to be allowed to buy land and become agricultural 
specialist in India, that meant something else entirely. And as I'll come to at the end, uh, the only person to actually point this out was a very young student of the Hindu College in this incendiary speech that he gave in 1830. So I'll, I'll, I'll end with uh, that speech. Okay, so of the Bengali newspapers, the Shamacha Chandrika was conservative and allied with the landowners and opposed to Ramun's progressive Shongbat Komudi, while the Serampur missionaries Shamachar Dorpun formed the third angle, as we shall see in the debates of 1829. And the students' opinions, of course, were largely ignored until taken up by the London-based Asiatic Journal. The missionary run Shomachar Dorpun's anti-colonizer position is interesting and complicated, and its anti-colonizer position could well be inferred to have arisen from witnessing firsthand the degradation suffered by indigo workers and taking an independent ethical set of position, positions with regard to the whole issue of colonization that resolved so crucially also around the question of indigo. So in the original paper here, um, there is a reference to the fact that William Carey himself, for instance, um, before he moved to Serampur and put up, established the first printing press um, in Bengal financed uh, his endeavor through indigo plantations in the Malda region of Bengal. Um, I have a student who's actually just written a PhD on that, very interesting uh, point. James Long, of course, everybody knows the, the Reverend James Long, who was uh, sort of, you know, a great campaigner on uh, the depredations of um, indigo uh, uh, plantation owners um, later on in the century, 1850s, 1860s. So, on August 22nd, 1831, in the India Gazette, we find a couple of paragraphs from the Bengali Ch Chandrika that put its bewilderment on the issue of colonization most succinctly. I'm quoting. On Tuesday, the 15th of December last, some Calcutta English merchants and babus assembled at the town hall to determine upon a petition to parliament to throw open the China trade and to permit Europeans to become talukdars and to engage in the cultivation of lands where, when the honorable company's charter should expire. We fancy that of the natives of India, only Babu Darukanath Thakur and Babu Prashunnu Kumar Thakur, uh, called in the English papers Prasan Nate to God, it actually mentions, were present. But none of the honorable company's civil or military servants attended the meeting, and we cannot learn from any paper what is their opinion on the subject. We have a few words to say on this subject. The English desire to become talukdars and cultivators. This will be advantageous to them. More particularly will the plan be profitable to the indigo men. They are now obliged to carry on their operations by taking izaras from the natives. In in time to come, they will become talukdars and acquire sovereignty over the poor, wretched inhabitants of the country. Be that as it may, I want to know what advantage this will bring to the natives who have signed or may sign the petition. If any of our readers will send this information to the native papers, many may be induced to second it. So, the Chandrika is not opposed to colonization wholesale. It concedes it may be persuaded, though the tone is certainly skeptical. The English desire to become talukdars, etc. An organ of the Dharma Shabha, comprised as it was of the wealthiest men in Bengal, many of whom were landowners, the question asked here is on behalf of those who may sign. The riots were poor and wretched. Be that as it may, it rather cavalierly asked, what advantage will the petition bring to those who may sign or already have signed? Certainly all who could sign were from the elite classes, confident of putting their signatures on a petition to the British Parliament. As far as the Indians were concerned, the division was not between conservatives, between the conservatives and reformers, but between landholders and the others. A letter writer calling himself one desiring the good of his country wrote to the editor of the Komudi giving a graphic, graphic description of the debates on colonization among the landholding classes that I shall quote in full. So this is what he says. At the time when the petition against colonization was signed, to whatever zamindar's house we could go, the chief topic of conversation was the good or evil to be expected from the English settling in the country and engaging in agriculture. Some said that evil was certainly to be anticipated from it. Sir, said they, what injustice the indigo planters are doing. But the zamindars replied to this with a laugh. You think only of the injustice of the indigo planters, but cannot regard the injustice which they experience from our countrymen. How shall we describe that which happens at a distance. At the end of 1824, there was a trial for the murder of an indigo planter, first before the magistrate of Nudia and then before the circuit judge. And whose was the wrong in that business? And in a late trial of the same sort at Hooghly, what sort of injustice on the part of the natives was not discovered? 
The opponents on hearing such things observed, we suppose then you will not sign the petition? Are you not aware of the evils that will arise from their coming? The Zamindars replied, we do not anticipate any evil whatsoever from their coming. On the contrary, the landlords will receive more rent, more laborers will be required and they'll receive higher wages, the land will be improved and we shall see many other improvements. When there is a deficiency of rain, the cultivation will be carried on by raising water by machinery. Knowledge will be promoted in the country villages. Now the people are afraid whenever they see the sahibs, but then they will be familiar with them. The poor receiving higher wages, there will be a great diminution of robbery in the country. If all this good is to be expected, why should we pray for its prevention? The opponents replied, such and such babus will entreat you on this business. The landholders said again, those who make such entreaties cannot surely be proprietors of land. They must be some Calcutta traders or public officers. What do they know of what is good or bad in the Mufasil, that we should be diverted by their opposition from supporting what will be productive of so much advantage? Thinking the publication of this conversation expedient, I have sent it to you. Thus ends the letter. So the landholders seem to echo the editor of the Bengal Hurkaru verbatim on the utopian future of the countryside under indigo planters brought directly from England. We are unsure which side the one desiring the good of his country supports because he doesn't actually explicitly say anything in the letter. Um, except that he presents the paper with the private conversation of some landholders deeming it important to pre present their position. The landholders here are indignant that we should think only of the injustices per perpetrated by indigo planters. What about the injustices they suffer from our countrymen such as when they are murdered? Interestingly, the Babus, by which is denoted the English educated professional class in salaried service mostly, um, though they call Darukunath Tagore a Babu there as well, seem to be the ones entreating against colonization. So perhaps the one desiring the good of his country is one such Babu or educated man intending to hold the venality of the landowners up on display. Those who oppose colonization, the landlords rightly surmise, are those who were surely not proprietors of land. Calcutta traders or public officers is the guess. And what do they and the Babus know of the rural hinterland? What is most remarkable in this continuing debate, though, is the perspective of the Shomachar Dorpun, the Bengali paper published by missionaries Marshman and Company from Serampur, which was of the opinion. I quote them. If colonization be permitted, the English will come in excessive numbers and settling themselves on the land, engage in the cultivation of the soil and establish many manufactories. Some have imagined that this will increase general wealth and happiness, but this is a fallacious hope. For there are many proofs which plainly show that through their engaging in manufactures, the natives of this country are reduced to the greatest distress. The state of Ireland will show the happiness which would flow from their becoming Jomidars and Talukdars. This is not the first time Ireland has been mentioned in this context and I'll come to another important uh, instance again later in the student paper. So the Shomacha Torpun piece then goes on to supply a most interesting comparison between rates charged by builders, carpenters, goldsmiths, tailors and even boatmen, showing how trade in all these occupa occupations has suffered already from the influx of the English into India. 20 years ago, when there were no English builders in this metropolis, he says, so he's referring here to Calcutta in 1810, Sultan Ajuddin Chand and many other native builders acquired fortunes by following that trade. But then, some English mysteries came here and monopolized that trade. Among these, Bruce and Smiley, Byrne and Curry and others have acquired many lakhs of rupees, abandoned the trowel, some returned to their, their own country, some be began to wield the pen. On the other side, the unfortunate native mysteries left their trowels and put on a turban. When that was gone, they took to the spade. Now they are in a state of starvation. I therefore judge that through the English mysteries having taken up the trade, the native mysteries have been completely ruined. A similar story unfolds with regard to carpenters who have been ru ruined by Rolton Company and other English carpenters taking possession of that trade and the deceased Ramtunu Ghosh and other natives relinquished the rule and took to the chisel. So with the goldsmiths whose business was destroyed by Hamilton and Company and as for tailors, why? Natives such as Ramjan Ustagar and other acqu others acquired property in this occupation but now with Gibson and Company and Simpson and Company, those who lived by the needle have, rather extremely it says, uh, through the want of food become as thin as needles. 
Even Boltzmann's business, as, as the Dottos acquired large fortunes by letting out sloops and bajaros, but now the English have established boat offices. Just judge then, it concludes, to what distress four or five manufacturers who have taken the trade of this city have reduced the native, the, uh, the article concludes. Can you not then determine what fatal consequences will ensue from their coming in greater numbers? Finally, the native youth. So more debate written by a native youth. So letters, editorials, reprinted articles and speeches and extracts from other newspapers, both vernacular and foreign, all of these were used for a constant flow of argument on the subject of colonization, backwards and forwards from the grand general meeting of the inhabitants of Calcutta in 1829 onward. Different groups, vested interests, political ideologies all clashed in an, in an attempt to shape the outcome to be decided far away on English soil, but connected nevertheless through cross-communication taking place among the various publications, newspapers, journals, periodicals, all linked to each other laboriously but robustly through networks of reading publics across continents. While the Bengal Hukaru and the India Gazette, as I've already said, put forward a steady stream in favor of colonization and the lifting of the monopoly in Calcutta, James Silk Buckingham, a tireless advocate of free trade over a long period of time, kept up a steady flow of articles and reportage for colonization in the Oriental Herald and Colonial Review, which was not the only publication, but one among many speaking for the motion in England itself. The only publication of note, if we discount the John Bull in Calcutta, that was on the side of the East India Company was the Asiatic Journal, published from Leadenhall Street in London, but picking up and highlighting the opposition to colonization whenever possible. On Tuesday, February 8, 1831, an editorial in the India Gazette expressed outrage at the ridiculous importance attached by the Asiatic Journal to an article which appeared in it the previous year, on the 12th of February, 1830. So note the one-year time lag uh, between the original publication, its reappearance in a London journal, and then the reaction to it again in Calcutta. In publishing this paper, written by a native youth, the India Gazette editorial said, we expressly stated that we presented it to our readers rather as a specimen of native literature literary talent in research than of correct reasoning. It had never occurred to the editor, he said, never entered our conceptions that any Englishman could be missiled by the assumptions of the ingenious writer. The writer and his connections are known to the editor, who is inclined to believe that he was not convinced by his own arguments, but was merely conducting an intellectual exercise. Such is the lack of sound argument on that side of the question, however, that the Asiatic Journal swallows it all in the mass, flesh, skin and bones, and smacks his lips after it as a rare morsel against colonization. There is no certainty about who wrote the article that lay at the heart of all that sound and fury, but in all probability it was a young student of Derosier's at the Hindu College, part of the loose formation later labelled Young Bengal. Young Bengal has been mocked for its pretensions, derided for its ambitions, and sneered at for its lack of convictions, almost consistently from the very moment it came into existence. And the editor of the India Gazette is no exception. The article seems to have been read out on February 4th, 1830, so two months after the 1829 meeting that we started with. And the speech starts with a reference to a society. The subject, he says, uh, which uh, I am desirous of introducing to the society is of very great importance to the natives of this country, particularly as it may involve them in a change not easily or perhaps never after to be repealed. This society, it seems reasonable to assume, uh, would have been the academic association run by De Rosio and David Hare in Calcutta in these years, 1828 to 1831. So the importance of Derosio's own position, uh, as well as his students' concurrent uh, views against colonization, is of some significance here. So I I don't know how I'm doing for time, but I could yeah. Um, so if we look at um, a magazine edited by Derosio himself called the Kaleidoscope, uh, he edited Derosio edited it in 1829 and 1830. Um, the magazine published an article uh, titled "On the Colonization of India by Europeans." And uh, this, the uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, 
attribution was to somebody with the initials SJ. Um, so here, three months before the December meeting, the arguments both for and against colonization were put forth. And it's interesting to speculate upon the editor de Rosio's almost certain concurrence in its views. I entertain strong doubts, SJ writes. So this is uh, a uh, magazine mostly run by East Indians, as they were called then. So this would be the mixed race community, actually, uh, that, that this viewpoint is coming from. Um, so I entertain strong doubts, SJ writes, whether Europeans can settle in the country without gradually dispossessing the natives of their lands and causing thereby incalculable misery and dissatisfaction. He also says in no uncertain terms, the most superficial observer must perceive that India is maintained in subjection by military force and military force is um, emphasized. Withdraw it and the boasted opinion of the natives instead of supporting would immediately prove the cause of the utter subversion of empire. We have lately read in one of the papers that at Lucknow during the late Muharram, prayers were publicly said for the destruction of the company's government. Now, it is evident that if a large number of Europeans were um, to be allowed to settle in the country, they would form a counterpoise in some degree to the hostile dispositions of the native subjects. But rather than allow that, the writer pleads rather for, quote, admitting natives and Indo-Britons to a participation of privileges on a similar footing as far as practicable and expedient with the Europeans. The main body of the argument made by the native youth in his speech in 1830 that the India Gazette had printed and then a year later denounced had involved a recital of precedents. So the speaker starts with ancient Greece, proceeds to the Roman colonies, and then enumerates a third sort of colony, namely colonies of trade. Of these, he starts with the ancient Phoenicians, but comes soon enough to the modern colonies, among which the example of Ireland is the first to be cited. The British settled Ulster without paying the Irish for their lands, as they were considered rebels, and all the conspiracies the Irish formed and barbarously executed served only to dispossess them further. British historians, the speaker points out, treat at great length the inhumanity of the Irish against the settlers, which he says, quote, at once points, point, points out, at once points out how they hated and detested them. And is it possible that they so much disliked those that acted as friends towards them? He asked. The argument then goes to America and the arrival of the British in the reign of Elizabeth, upon whose settling there, quote, mighty disputes ensued between the red and white men. And the white men, in their desire to improve the red men, then, quote, introduced among them rum, gin, brandy, and the other comforts of life, such as, he says, the benefit of medicines, after, of course, first introducing the, de the diseases they were calculated to cure. At present, the settlers have formed a republican government of their own, and the aborigines are driven into the interior parts of the country, where they adhere, he says, to their ancient rights and manners, as they are by no means desirous of being slaves to the white men. Next discussed are New Holland's discovery by the Dutch and the English in 1618 and the colonies of the Spaniards, which he says afford far greater example of oppression and cruelty, including the case of the Peruvians and their massacre and betrayal. The speaker then comes to the crux of the matter, the colonization of India. In not even one of the historical facts above quoted, he says, can be found an example in which the condition of the aboriginal inhabitants of a country, the aboriginal is emphasized, has, has been ever bettered by colonization, nay, so far from it that it can safely be asserted that in every part of the world, since colonies were first established to the present day, the original inhabitants of a country have always suffered from the experiment." Unquote. So what would happen in India? Quote, if good and honest English farmers were induced to leave their delightful homes, is it certain, I quote, that they would cultivate such things as would be beneficial to the natives of this country? Large cabbages and fine blue indigo would be produced, no doubt, but who would care if the produce of rice was bettered or not, provided there could be found meat sufficient to afford them ample food? Another assumption is scoffed at in no uncertain terms. It has been asserted by some Europeans that English laborers could do work a great deal more 
this, this is his phrasing, than the natives of this country. But it is prejudice alone that makes them say so. The European also is a human being as well as the native. And I, for my own part, sincerely believe that the native can work as much as any European workman could do. Nay, I may even add that in a climate like this, the native could work more than the European. Everyone then would suffer. Zamindars, riots, craftsmen and agriculturists. And India, quote, requires no importation of articles from other countries to promote the welfare and happiness of its inhabitants. In short, and we come now to the last part of the article. In short, the article concludes quite seriously, we need not wish for colonization any more than, as Mr. Irving observes in one of his works, the inhabitants of Europe would desire their country to be colonized by men in the moon. A hilarious discuss discussion of Mr. Irving's thesis, who, within brackets, is, he says, is a citizen of the USA, follows, based certainly on Washington Irving's story, The Men of the Moon, in his 1809 satire, A Knickerbocker's History of New York. Our native speaker provides his own spin on the story of aerial visitants whose, quote, sailing in the air and cruising among the stars is no more astonishing to Europeans than their own technology is to simple savages faced with gunpowder and glittering steel. The aerial voyagers, however, finding this planet a howling wilderness, take the president of this society, the King of England, and the Emperor of Haiti to their own native lands, just as the Indian chiefs are led about as spectacles through the courts of Europe, he mentions, and presented to their potentate as uncouth monsters who carry their heads on their shoulders instead of under their arms, have two eyes instead of one, are destitute of tails, and are coat of a horrible whiteness instead of pea green. These ignorant denizens have, quote, not a gleam of true philosophy among them, which necessitates the introduction of the lights of reason and the comforts of the moon among them, as well as their conversion from, quote, the darkness of Christianity. And when the natives of this earth do not respond, ungrateful wretches that they are, to the fact that these men from the moon have come thousands of miles to improve your worthless planet, our student speaker continues, they shall give up argument and demolish the world's cities with moonstones, banishing the people to the deserts of Arabia or the frozen regions of Lapland. Even such would be the fruits of colonization here, says the penultimate line of the essay, ending, a greater evil than colonization can in fact never happen. So very much is it to the disadvantage of the natives, and I therefore most sincerely hope that it will please our gracious sovereign to renew the charter of the East India Company on its expiration and thereby obtain the blessings of his loyal and loving subjects in the East. I finished. I'll just conclude with the outcomes because um, you'll want to know what happened uh, uh, um, at the end of all this um, sort of debate and discussion. So three years after this speech was read out in February 1830 at a society in Calcutta, the Charter Act of 1833 was successfully steered through the House of Commons by Macaulay. The bill effectively ended the East India Company's commercial life while retaining its governmental function. Residents and property rights in British India were allowed by the Act, which also allowed British subjects to move within the company's territories much more freely. All that the young student had argued against had come to pass. Historians such as Anthony Webster have shown how political events in Britain leading to the introduction of the Great Reform Act in 1832, quote, produced delays in the execution of the new charter, but on the substantive questions, its outcome, he says, was never in doubt. These questions included the company's monopoly on trade with China and also the vexed subject of our debate on whether or not to allow Europeans to reside in and acquire property on Indian soil and plain economic considerations settled the outcome once and for all. The position of the company in 1829 was even weaker than during the first renewal of 1812-1813 in respect of the China monopoly. Its finances had deteriorated and trade rapidly declined with private merchant houses such as Bearings now dominating British exports and the company suffered severe losses. 
The campaign against the monopoly of the company was fought not just in Calcutta, but as I've said, crucially <coughs> in the north of England, with the provincial merchants and manufacturers of Glasgow, Liverpool and Manchester forming East India associations and fighting a concerted battle against the renewal of the company's charter and thereby for colonization. These were the venues at which James Silk Buckingham and George Thompson were star speakers. Defenders of the company's privileges did surprisingly little to lobby in their own defense and seemed filled with resignation and fatalism. As it happens, history proved some of the fears of those against colonization to have substance. As the gates were indeed opened up, the monopoly of the East India Company abolished and the free market allowed a free reign. Although India did not turn into, an, into a settler colony as a result, <coughs> what history also shows, however, is that with the removal of all restrictions on the indigo planters, the lot of the peasants in indigo plantations worsened to the point that the Blue Mutiny or Indigo Revolt of the 1860s in Bengal became an inevitable consequence of the triumph of free trade and colonization in a conquered country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Not too bad for time. The debate sec continued 200 years later. <laughs> yes. uh, let me open this up to questions, comments, feedback. Hmm. So I have several questions. Oh, could I have a few for you start? Okay. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, go ahead. Ready? Go ahead. 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 Maybe you chairs privilege. Uh, I, I, I was going to start with this, uh, the first one. As to this debate about the British, you keep calling them the English, but are they just the English or are no, they? No, of course not. Yeah, not. so, so the British, British yes. uh, and them getting this mm. uh, license to mm. colonize mm. India, mm. and the debates which were, which questioned that, the freedom to do mm. so, the license mm. to do so. Mm. But were, the, were at that time, I mean, perhaps the answer is no, but at that time in the 1820s and uh, 1830s, were people ever questioning the rights of the zamidars themselves mm. to to you know to to take greater control of land mm. and to grow whatever they want or was it only sort of a, a question of these outsiders coming the co colonialists coming and taking over or were there ever any questions of mm. uh, you know how the, whoever the students were whoever mm. uh, anyone else was were, were these questions ever raised about the Bengali Zamedars themselves, mm -hmm. or was that never discussed? No. So shall I sort of take them one by one? There's a brief answer to this yeah. one. Um, no would be the brief answer, mm. um, <clears throat> except that there's a lot of um, um, concern at this time. Very uh, so. So this actually sort of um, goes into the second cha the chapter that follows um, this one. <clears throat> there's a lot of concern in starting around 1840, 1842, mm -hmm. uh, and the, and there is writing on this subject, which is what I'm I'm trying to access on the sufferings of the Indian peasant mm -hmm. it never so so the riot and his his suffering comes up and so I was very curious and I really uh, was trying to figure out why suddenly the educated more or less elite mm -hmm. uh, students of the Hindu college who by now by 1840 have entered into their professions or whatever work mm -hmm. they were they were doing why they were writing about the sufferings of the peasant at all even if it's an idealized figure of you know Rousseauian figure of the of the peasant as has been claimed um, um, it has to do with colonial um, policy. Um, uh, uh, there was in 1839 something called um, uh, an act passed on the resumption of rent-free lands. So all this is linked to, so again in answer to, in partial answer to your question, it's linked to what happened uniquely in Bengal with British rule, which was of course the permanent settlement. Mm -hmm. And the permanent settlement is something that has been written about from Ronajit Guho and Eric Stokes downward, I mean endlessly. But basically it established um, uh, uh, an occupancy of land by the Bengali zamindars uh, for whom the estates sort of became like estates uh, as they were for the British uh, aristocrats uh, in England in a manner that then was not replicated anywhere else in the West or the South mm -hmm. because because of the critics because of the criticism of these uh, uh, you know uh, of the flaws in the permanent settlement from within British circles as well there was a lot of writing there are 
reports. There's, there's an 1807 very famous Buchanan Hamilton report, uh, and the continuous writing um, uh, writing by Montgomery Martin later on, sitting in London using the Buchanan Hamilton report on the inequities, on the on the unfairness of some of uh, uh, that system, uh, and uh, calling for reform. So what happened in 1839 was there was a sudden um, um, sort of um, so without going into it's, it's a huge labyrinth agri agrarian history and I've been trying to sort of you know wrap my head around it a little bit um, uh, so what happened was that there was uh, the, the government called for a, a, a categorization of the land which wasn't which uh, which the peasants or which the cultivators of that land didn't actually have title deeds for and th there was quite a lot of this land so it was hereditary rights under the Mughal regime yeah. so they didn't actually so if they couldn't produce the papers yeah. they were being turned out so, so all, all that ferment gave rise to a concern with the sufferings of these, you know, often few bigas of land, not very sort of, you know, um, uh, 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 prosperous riots at all. Um, so, so that's why then suddenly in the in 1842, 1840, 41, 42, in both Bengali and English, we get a s hmm. slew of writings by these people on the sufferings of the peasant, but not so far as to say let's do away with the zamindar. That so the in answer to your question, yes, yeah, no, no I, they, I would then, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, they didn't actually ever sort of envisage um, uh, uh, a future without uh, the Bengalis Zamindar. No, they didn't. Yeah. So my second question is about the tangential remark you made about three essays which were written based mm -hmm. on uh, Roy not being there mm -hmm. or not saying much. Mm -hmm. was there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, what's the, the the politics and mm -hmm. the history mm -hmm. uh, and the history of the history of mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. that moment? Mm -hmm. I mean, and what is its significance? Because you mm -hmm. you seem to you make the you make the argument in that that the three essays were written based on this one paragraph mm -hmm. about him not saying very mm -hmm. much. So what is the sort of broader mm -hmm. impact mm -hmm. of rethinking and when, when were these essays published? In 1975, yeah. huge impact. So, so, so what does this mean? How do you locate yeah. this one paragraph yeah. in the history of, you know, yeah. Uh, of Bengali intellectuals and thinking about the past. This is the very, very interesting thing that I actually um, uh, began uh, 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 the paper with. So the part that I didn't read out. Um, <laughs> for me, it was a revelation to actually see um, uh, that um, this entire... We all know, of course, the manner in which uh, the Southern Studies historians uh, be began to question. So, 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 actually, ever since that volume in 1975, that was when the, the whole category of the Bengal Renaissance uh, was brought into question. When you and and subsequently, of course, you couldn't refer to it except within quotation marks. Um, it 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 was not a it was not a Renaissance. Was the, was the basic uh, point being made, as Shumit Sharka said, because it just across religious lines and across no, class yeah, yeah, lines, it was just wasn't limited. extensive. Yeah, yeah. Yes, very limited. limited yeah. uh, so the defenders pointed out that the Italian Renaissance was no doubt equally limited <laughs> in terms of its class um, uh, composition. But um, anyway, um, so so these three essays uh, appeared in this 1975 volume. And the interesting thing to me was that they were premised exactly as, as you're saying quite rightly, they were premised on, um, if not this one paragraph, at least this one article in the Bengal Hurkaru that they had access to in Calcutta. Mm. This was what was so interesting to me because I was, I, uh, my research in this area has been done mostly perforce uh, in the British Library because the newspaper archive for this period and, and that follows from my work on De Rosio because De Rosio is a little uh, decade before before that too actually you don't get the full picture unless you look at the entire newspaper archive actually the speech that I refer to in the end the entire thing is reprinted sort of in the newspaper so that's where I've got it from from the newspapers so so that's actually coming into the light of day for the first time since uh, it was read it hasn't been treated by historians since then so um, basically then what happens is that these three essays um, and then Partha Chatterjee writes a very influential uh, review article in the EPW on these three essays which mm -hmm. he ironically titles Our Fathers mm -hmm. and he too then sort of you know um, probably 
traumatizes though he is fair enough in that review too to say that we don't actually have enough but then they keep saying this Shubhichakar also says we don't actually have uh, all the materials that we should have but nevertheless mm -hmm. and they, they, they simply dismantle uh, uh, all of that so sort of that, that category of the renaissance brick, brick by brick and then and since then because of the predominance of the subaltern studies group and and of course of that sort of whole uh, sort of left school of um, thought it has been a disputed category so for me the interesting thing while looking at this period was to see how little it was actually based on that that entire dismantling because if you look at the larger um, sort of history if you if you if you look at a speech like that young student made mm. people are not aware of the fact that there was this young student who stood up mm. and 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 these, these are people who are not taken very seriously mm. at all by historians to date mm. so so the fact that they actually stood up and 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 pointed out clear headedly as perhaps only students can that you know where in the world have the native inhabitants the aboriginals as he calls them of a country done well when uh, white men have <laughs> colonized that country just just um, just that point just that that point of view was there and mm. and that it had been read out as a speech and that it had then been reprinted in the Bengal Karu and then again in the Asiatic Journal in London and that it had created all of this, this there was no aware, awareness of this because mm. these archives are mm. were not accessed by those historians in 1975 so that's another critique of subaltern stuff <laughs> in a sense okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, so you know I was wondering whether uh, how one could link this very interesting um, scrutiny of what you call the local debates and the local um, with what the local dis disputants and protagonists mm. uh, what sense they have of the of the non-local mm. that is of the larger picture mm. that is th there are these local debates going on mm. but do they have some uh, Premonitional thing of l larger tendencies mm -hmm. within which they are, and and as you point out, uh, to come to the conclusion that nowhere mm -hmm. has uh, it been uh, good for the local inhabitants is already to framework it mm -hmm. comparativistically mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. not only other uh, imperial. Uh, state, but you know, the moon thing mm. makes you go mm. uh, to a very large framework <laughs> indeed, right? So uh, stepping very far back. So, so the question I have is: Do the the protagonists you've you've studied here have a sense of the direction, the directional differences between settler colonialism mm. and? other things that might be happening which could not possibly amount to settler colonialism but would nevertheless raise questions about what would happen when the trade monopoly of the company was undermined right and colonial goods now could go to various parts of the world mm -hmm. without the, the overseeing of it by, by the East India Company mm -hmm. so so how much did these people understand right uh, the the quote you make about nowhere has have the local inhabitants ever really been well off in these things is is of course, but it's it's a very general statement, mm -hmm. right? So so what mm -hmm. I'm wondering is mm -hmm. is there an intermediate level of description mm -hmm. where you can ask the question, for instance, settler colonialism tends to happen in the temperate belt, mm -hmm. right? Where different kinds of goods are produced than in the tropical. Yeah. So if you go to the North America, Canada and, and what is now the United States mm. or Australia and so on, you, you have, uh, and New Zealand, you, you have uh, a temperate belt with one kind of goods being produced. Mm. The tropical is completely different. As a result, settler colonialism in the temperate belts is really a diffusion of capitalism. Right? It isn't, it isn't, uh, you don't have things like what are these, uh, critics of uh, the drain and so on. It's mm. not a question of drain, it's mm. just a question of diffusing capital mm. and making those countries basically incipient mm. capitalist nations. Mm. Uh, whereas it's, you know, there's no reason mm. for these protagonists to 
think that this is exactly what's going to happen just by the fact that the mm -hmm. trade monopoly is mm -hmm. going to be mm -hmm. undermined by, by the meeting mm -hmm. that are going to happen, right? That's 1833, is it? Yes. Yeah, right. So, so, you know, there's an intermediate level of description to ask about these local mm -hmm. uh, uh, protagonists. How are they thinking? Are they making these distinctions? So, uh, it's very interesting to think, to speculate. One would have to speculate. Yeah. Um, it's so. There's obviously no discussion at, at, at an abstract level uh, to the extent that people are actually using wor words like capitalism. I'm not even sure whether words like capitalism were uh, in existence at the time. Right. Right. Um, so, so, but what they do have is a very keen sense of, so, so, so you're absolutely right in that it is of course a diffusion of capitalism into all these uh, uh, societies. But a, diffu a diffusion of capitalism which imposes very, very unfair um, terms and conditions upon the flow of goods in the opposite direction. Right. So you have various petitions being sent to uh, uh, Parliament preceding all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, so somewhere around the 18, so this is 1833, so some, somewhere in 18, uh, sort of the, the late 1820s, 1830s, at exact, mm -hmm. in exactly this period. From uh, uh, so these petitions were sent by uh, wealthy native merchants mm. from Calcutta to the British Parliament, saying you are sort of saying exactly this, saying that you are you have lifted all duties on the on the coming of goods into our country, but when we try and send our silks and cottons, which was of course a huge um, uh, earner for uh, Bengal especially and India generally in the 18th century, sure. as you know. Um, you, the, the, the duties and tariffs imposed on us are, and they enumerate, so you know, sort of humongous duties, so which makes it very difficult for them to send their goods into Britain or Europe anymore yeah. to, to, to make their profit, I mean, to, to, to become prosperous themselves. So there is a keen sense of injustice and, and an understanding of, if not in a larger, more abstract sense of the diffusion of capitalism, certainly in that something is changing here, where, which, is, which is changing in a very unfair way, in that you are forcing us to buy your goods, but you are refusing to allow us to sell our goods to you. So, so petitions are being sent to parliament yes. on exactly this, this sort of question, saying that, uh, you, because there is in this period, right up till the mutiny, I think there is in this period still a belief that that lovely phrase that SJ uses a participation of privileges um, the, the 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 title of Blair Kling's um, uh, 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 book on Darukonath Tagore partner in empire this is a period I've now realized while mm. trying to reconstruct it where the British and the Indians British meaning the independent Britons mm. uh, you know the, the traders in this instance but the, the, the missionaries mm. there are various constituencies that are free not the East India company yeah, officials, yeah. not the yeah, government, yeah, yeah. who are actually partnering with with yeah, the Indians yeah, sure. in order to um, uh, sort of um, fight the fights that th that yeah. need to be fought for, for whichever constituency. Right. This coming together is deeply uh, sort of uninteresting to all historians uh, 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 sort of who've, who've written about the history of India. It was really a question I began this research with. I, I remember because I have Parthuda right there down the corridor and other historians like Gautam Padru and Deepesh, I actually sat them down, these, these subaltern historians, and I said, why, before you were, sort of, you are historians, I mean, uh, apart from being subaltern school historians, why is there, why can I not find histories on the 1830s and 40s apart from you know one or two can you tell me what to read what what exactly it there's a lot on agrarian history yes there's 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 a huge amount there but but what and whenever I would ask the question which is what my so these chapters are part of the larger project is young Bengal they would inevitably simply say you know, so my conclusion was, so so Parthida used a very interesting phrase, which I, fi I find also now in Shumit Chorka's article, which which is basically, Parthida said no, nothing came of it. And Shumit Chorka uses the phrase, um, all of this came to nil, N he italicizes nil, you know, no, nothing happened, nothing nothing actually sort of, you know, um, came out of all this. Do you mean, yeah. what do they mean, that there was no settler? No, but, no, 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 so now I'm talking yeah. of the larger thing about young Bengal, uh, ah, of, of, of reform, of 
of agitation oh, of a speech such as the student is making. So, yeah. so what happens? All these speeches are made, and there's yeah. all this so rhetoric no, and hot air, but yeah. nothing actually no happens uh, in 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 a, in a concrete way. Um, I also think it's this whole indifference to this period um, is is due to a deep sense of embarrassment, in the sense that these are people number one who want to partner with the British, number two who speak in the English language and who write these speeches. The speech that I read out to you, uh, uh, parts of, uh, was written in the English language. So these are people who write in English, uh, speechify in English, and do not use Bengali except I'm sure for personal reasons. Um, they do do a lot of writing in Bengali as well, though it is a bilingual culture. But that part is sort of not so so because of these reasons the larger mm. sort of you know mm. this period is not a period that historians have mm. been interested in and um, to, to, to narrow it down to the question you're asking mm. um, there is a, a very keen understanding of the fact that uh, capital is not flowing uh, equally in both directions for instance there is a uh, the, I was I'm always astonished by how informed they are how many I mean the newspapers take time to travel from one continent to the other but the Americans are aware of Ram Mohan Roy sitting here in the, you know this continent um, of what he's doing there he's aware of what's happening in uh, sort of Latin America and he's a great supporter of you know uh, what's happening there with Bolivar and all of that it, there's, a, there's a huge amount of um, connectivity that's happening because of print culture at this time which is of course also all internationalist in character it's not yet nationalism it's not yet. Yes. It's not yet. Um, but if I recall, the, can I just pursue this? Mm. But if I recall what Naroji and all said mm. about, about this uh, unequal, part of the problem. A little later. A little later. No, but they were mm. describing the yes. whole the whole colonial mm. period. Mm. So they were describing mm. this period mm. too, right? Mm. They were analyzing right. Right. everything since mm. the company mm. came mm. into, uh, uh, including in the in the post freeing period, mm. including post 1833. Naroji was writing about the whole history. Mm -hmm. uh, and his point, if I recall now, I mean, the, uh, you could correct, you probably uh, know it better than I do, but his point was that that the system, I mean, the fiscal system and the trade system were brought together mm -hmm. and taxation mm -hmm. on the peasant producers mm -hmm. um, gave them money by which they could then buy the goods needed by the metropole at prices that were not high. So because the metropole didn't want them at very high mm -hmm. prices. So the, the idea of the drain mm -hmm. was precisely the idea that you tax, you get revenue from it, you get the goods cheaply, and you buy the goods and send the goods. And so you're perfectly right that you know there is this complaint that you know there's an unequal, <coughs> but but this is actually worse, right? This is actually getting the goods at a cheaper price <coughs> by having a, a punitive tax system mm -hmm. on on the peasant producers. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious: mm -hmm. was this in any way part of what this young person said when he said the? Uh, 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 you know, uh, the the native inhabitants are never going to be well off. Uh, I mean, was he just no. saying it about yeah. right, having yes. this broad comparison with what the, what you call yes. the Reds and and the yep. Maoris and the yeah. and yeah. the uh, yeah. uh, Australian Aborigines in that sense, yeah. or was he did he ha did so, he have so a finer sense for of, yeah. whether the, how fine grained mm. the understanding is mm. at this intermediate level? No, not very finely grained at all. I mean, he he's the student in who's giving the speech in 1830 would be a maximum of 18 or 19 years old. This is the interesting thing to me as well. Gotcha. So it's, uh, because so it's <laughs> no, 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 no. It it is broad strokes, yeah. and it is sort of you know a, 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 a sort of you know very warm nice. rhetoric. But it it always surprises me as well to think about. So, so when I was doing the research on Derosio as well, to realize that Derosio is teaching um, sort of fourteen and fifteen year olds when he himself is seventeen or eighteen years old. So you understand then how, how they form such a tightly knit group group and why they got along so well. Um, but so this is a few years later. So by 18 
1830, so he's in the Hindu college in 1826. By 1830, he's three or four years older. So the 14 year old would now be an 18 year old at the most. So no, yes, so you, I, that would be a bit too much to expect right. from. Yeah, so I'm just, yeah. just generally curious about yeah. how hard people were thinking about yeah. this, uh, yeah. about the nature of yeah. of the colonization de debate. Just to you know, yeah. how well did they understand what what it was? So yeah, very hard question. To very hard. Out. Yes, very uh, hard. Yes. Un yeah. Unless one finds, uh, yeah. sort of, you know, more yeah. material where, sure. where, uh, yeah. Another question, Daya? Um, I was wondering um, if it's, so I know that during the Indigo Blue Uprising in 1859-60, there was a lot of discussion of the Rio as like serfs, mm -hmm. and that kind of intersected with the condemnation of serfdom that was happening around, uh, in Russia, in like, in British journals, sorry, and mm -hmm. the Harpuru, I think, mm -hmm. as well. I was wondering if this intersected at all in the 18, 20s and early 30s with debates over slavery. Mm -hmm. I know that debates over the retiring of the company mm -hmm. in 1833 also intersected with obviously the abolition of the slave trade in Britain in 1833. So did that ever come up where the railroads were discussing slaves or did that intersect with discussions of slavery at all? It did. It did. That that that's that's uh, that's another very interesting part of, of what happens here. So, so do you know George Thompson? Are you are you aware of who George Thompson was? Or no. so 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 again, this is this is uh, always surprising when when uh, uh, for me sort of I, anyway I discovered him for myself while do while doing this work. So I keep thinking that maybe proper historians, guys who actually look into you know sort of um, uh, the, uh, the abolitionists and you know who they were and what they were. I always expect them to know but yeah no 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 but I've asked historians in Oxford as well when I was there last year they're not people who actually work on slavery and on this period in America are not actually aware very much of George Thompson at all so George Thompson is the star speaker uh, from Glasgow um, sorry yes from the north of England certainly he speaks in Glasgow a lot um, absolute celebrity as a speaker at this time. Um, he's actually received by President Lincoln um, in uh, 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 the House of Representatives in, uh, in around 1864 after all of this is over um, uh, uh, and, and honored by him for his contribution to the cause. He's, he's come to Boston several times. He's been shot at by Republicans, escaped in a woman's dress on a ship, etc. All of this sort of, you know, uh, sort of known material. People, people know him as. So he then um, after the Emancipation Act of 1833 turns his energy to India. So this is the interesting thing and then George Thompson arrives in India in 1843 and he lives in Calcutta for a year where he interacts very closely with young Bengal. So again subsequent chapter but in answer to your question uh, already in England the Aborigines Protection Society, the APS, mm -hmm. um, they are campaigning along with George Thompson uh, on the development of uh, cotton growing in India um, as a, a cotton that would replace uh, the cotton grown by the southern states in uh, in the U.S. and 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 the abolitionists are very interested in promoting this because if they can stop the sort of you know the the the, the sale of cotton. Uh, that sort of fundamentally, they realize, will affect the whole, you know, uh, slavery discussion as well. So yes, a lot of discussion uh, about non-slave grown cotton and that that cotton could be grown in India and, and could easily sort of, you know, uh, all of that, it's, it's, all, it's all interconnected at this time and there's a lot of talk going on in relation to this as well because Thompson is also one of the great speechifiers for free trade. Mm -hmm. So, 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 um, so it's all sort of... Um, Yes, there is a lot of uh, talk between the various constituencies, and and yes, um, slavery uh, is mentioned more than once, um, uh, as is non-slave grown cotton and the whole Indian economy and how that can contribute. Yeah. There's a question there. Yeah. Um, so, uh, apologies if I missed this first go round, but um, can I just ask to you to clarify that you you characterize, as I recall, the the editors of Shmachal Open the Sarampur set mm. as being opposed to colonization, mm. making this comparison with Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, so other than the critique of missionaries, can can we get a sense of how far would they go along with it, the, the author of the, in the, the piece in the class that you mentioned towards the end? So the Shamacha Tarpun is a missionary paper, mm -hmm. right? Um, so so the missionaries, as I said, were actually first-hand witnesses to some of the sort of, you know, um, uh, 
oppression uh, in these indigo uh, plantations uh, that the peasants were suffering uh, from, uh, which is why they were throughout this period in the 1840s and 50s leading up to the disturbances in the 1860s, they were actually uh, constant advocates um, of, uh, um, you know, a change in the system. Um, so are you asking how much the students would be aligned with them? What, what is your question? How much would they be aligned with the students, essentially? I imagine they would sort of oh. get off the train at the bit where they start talking about, you know, the moon, the that analogy of the, uh, you know, converting the, the, from the darkness of Christianity and so forth. But so at a policy level, I guess. Uh, yeah, how much they're aligned with the students, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, I've, I've not seen any references in the missionary papers to this student speech in particular at all. I mean, obviously not. Um, but generally, with regard to the students, you see, the students were atheists. The missionaries didn't like them at all. Um, right from Duff to the they, the students were. I mean, De Rosio was dismissed because you know uh, he was accused of teaching David Hume uh, to 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 them, and he defends himself in his resignation letter but he says basically I taught them both sides of the question which is not but but they were <laughs> they they were the missionaries were not fond of this group of people because this group of people didn't believe in God and that in 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 1830s 1840s Calcutta <laughs> was not something the missionaries were encouraging at all so they wouldn't have in principle been on the side of the students very much even if they're political slash economic positions were well, they should have been, don't you think? Yes, I, I'll have to do more research in the archives for that, for the answer to that. I, I haven't actually found any explicit support of the students. There is a, there is support from the missionaries on, on the education they're getting, on on the fact that they're actually really very well read and that they're writing very well and that they're, you know, all in terms of the paternalistic, of course, paternalistic and you know, sort of, you know, look how well they're doing and how wonderfully they recite Shakespeare and stuff like that. I mean, there's 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 all of that, of course, but there is there is support. In, for that aspect of it, I, I'm not sure whether there would be support for this aspect of it, but I'm sure if if it was a missionary position that colonization was not a good idea for India, and this particular student was saying the same thing, I, I mean, I would have presumed that they would be concurring, but I mean, not in print, perhaps. I mean, at least if, if they were concurring in print, I'd have to search for it. I haven't found anything of that nature yet. David? I want to pursue what you started with, which is that you uh, are attempting to do a non-linear mm. uh, history, mm. a history in its own, the, of the period in its own terms. You don't quite stick with it in the end. You mm. uh, you have results and, mm. uh, and so on. Mm. But uh, just to think about that mm. a little bit of, uh, uh, and to respond to who uh, mm -hmm. uh, was saying mm -hmm. to you that, mm -hmm. or should be sure, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that it, it, it nothing happened, nothing mm -hmm. came to it. Mm -hmm. So how how does one think about that mm -hmm. project? Mm -hmm. uh, if you were a literary historian, mm -hmm. historian you mm -hmm. would think about well, it's valuable for its own sake, mm -hmm. and you could pick up that mm -hmm. essay mm -hmm. and maybe mm -hmm. think it's a, mm -hmm. a wonderful piece of literature mm -hmm. or, or something of that mm -hmm. sort. Um, or maybe you could stretch it horizontally uh, and, and see what other people are saying mm. at the same time mm. and is it part of a, mm. a, a common discourse. Right? Mm. I just wonder mm. about mm. Uh, that project mm -hmm. of, uh, mm. of not doing linear sure. history. Mm. I, it makes me think there, there are these children's books that maybe so people know mm. called mm. Choose Your Own Adventure, <laughs> yeah. you know, where you, you read along and then you can uh, take this line or that line and, and see where where it goes, and of course that's what writers do. That's yes. you know, novelists yes. do. They yes. make up yes. alternative yes. histories of yes. Philip Roth uh, yes. novels, which carry out the same story in many directions. Um, uh, is that what you're doing? Or? Sounds like the way to go. I'm not sure what I'm doing yet. Yeah. Um, so, so I am a literary historian. So maybe that's uh -huh. why. That's why the. So my I am actually qualified in English literature, not in history at all. I don't know what. I, I think this is what the center has done to me. It's turned me into a quasi historian. But my my work has always been actually at the intersection of literature and history. So I'm very very uncomfortable doing this work because I I find myself sort of um, almost in sort of withdrawal 
symptoms when I find I have no lines of poetry to turn to, no, no sort of you know novelistic sort of something, something that I can. For, for me, that is the meat of you know um, of the sort of work that I do. But here, I'm just doing a. And I, I I don't know why I'm doing. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm doing a history of young Bengal, but as I said, not uh, uh, not a linear history. So I think what I was thinking of when I said that was also um, uh, so 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 in the manner in which I've, I don't know whether I'll succeed, but that's the manner in which I did my so the the book that I uh, the last monograph that I published, which I call the literary thing. Um, that one is uh, taking a look at uh, Bengali poetry from its inception in the 1850s to a young Rabindranath Tagore in 1878, uh, um, uh, no, 1881 uh, or something. Anyway, the first successful poem he thinks he wrote. So, so, so this, that's the trajectory of, of, of that. Now, while I was struggling with that material as well, and finally the manner in which I wrote that book too, I found I simply couldn't or I didn't want to write a linear history saying this happened and then this happened and then that happened. I, I just find that fundamentally boring. The only way in which I could do it in the end, and it, it helped that it was literary material. I don't know if I, I hope I'll succeed with this historical material. I, do, I don't know if I will, if I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. But basically, uh, it was an episodic history in that I picked up certain moments of literary debate, argument, quarrel, to do with um, what should be in the school syllabus, um, what shouldn't be on the school. So in one instance, in another instance, this wonderful um, sort of early, um, uh, the, the first Bengali poet um, who, who wrote about, um, you know, um, the, the the English in Calcutta in this in this very humorous and sort of wonderful style, not considered a real poet at all, um, you know, in the sense of what a poet is, as as Bonkim Chandra said of him, he's not a poet in the sense in which Kalida and Mag are poets, you know, I mean poet, and he uses the English word poet, he says in the, and I will use the English word he says, he's writing in Bengali, but he says the English word poet, he says, anyway, sorry, digression. Uh, so basically I found the only way I could deal with that entire period, uh, although it was a demarcated period from this to that, it didn't actually do the journey from this to that, it just sort of looked at certain episodes in that period, which for me encapsulated some of the argument and debate and uh, so you pick up a meet so for me over here you pick up a meeting in in the first chapter which is what i've briefly discussed here you pick up the 1829 meeting and you see the ramifications or you know you just read that moment you know 1829 as as best you can from the materials uh, at hand um after this um I thought I was going to do a chapter on George Thompson, um, and, and that went uh, was halfway there and, until it got hijacked by what turned out then now to be perhaps the second chapter, which was to do with, because that, so again, uh, again, though I'm putting it in a linear way, because that comes before 1842. Uh, but again, um, looking at the writings of one of these students, um, a fellow classmate of this guy, most probably, uh, but another man called Pierre Chant Mitro, who writes these articles on the sufferings of the Bengal uh, uh, riot in 1841-42 um, why he's doing that why suddenly you know this this interest so in that way it's it's developing episodically in that way while still I suppose tenuously hanging on to some chronological sort of you know to, to just help me perhaps uh, organize my material I don't know if that's an adequate well, answer I think I think what you're doing is, is the right thing to do. And mm. I, 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 first of all, you have to start with that mm. because you can't really understand anything mm. unless you understand it in its own terms mm. to, to begin with. Mm. But also, if you think that you're studying like young Bengal mm. as, as a, um, a community of people, mm. as a discourse, mm. any mm. of those mm. sorts of things, mm. then you're studying it within that mm. framework mm. Of, of time. And it mm. really, in a, in a way, it may be relevant to uh, future developments in India, or it may be relevant in comparison to parallel things that happened in other places <coughs> and other, uh, and other times. Mm. But, uh, 
to do it mm -hmm. without worrying too much mm -hmm. about uh, mm -hmm. its its future implications mm -hmm. is, I think, the right course. <laughs> Thank I, you. Yeah, that's, so. that's a relief. Uh, yeah, hi. Actually, hi. my question is in some ways connected to the previous question. Mm -hmm. I wanted to hear, uh, um, and I also want to preface it by saying that I think some of the most useful and important contributions to historical scholarship or contributions to any discipline come from scholars who are working outside of the discipline and can bring fresh perspectives to mm -hmm. it. So I think it's important for people to be doing kind of trained in English literature to be mm -hmm. thinking about history and coming into debates with them. So I wanted to ask you to kind of put out for us a little bit more of what interventions come out of this work. So first of all, methodological interventions. Mm -hmm. How might one relate differently to archives and ideas of kind of temporal and chronological flow? Mm -hmm. Um, you talked a little bit about different kinds of sources and drawing mm -hmm. from them as mm -hmm. opposed to what historians have done to this mm -hmm. point. So, and you also mentioned kind of connected histories and how that might fit into this. So I wanted to hear a little bit about the methodological mm -hmm. contributions, mm -hmm. but also the sort of way that this scholarship intervenes with existing histories and chronologies mm -hmm. and kind of uh, timelines of historical development in South Asia and what in fact is going on. I mean, of course, we have very kind of rigid uh, timelines that we've received in surveys and teaching and reading and so forth about colonialism, mm -hmm. anti-colonialism, nationalism, the consolidation of empires, the consolidation of colonial knowledge mm -hmm. forms, and mm -hmm. how that all kind mm -hmm. of relates over a long timeline. Um, and this has been problematized by a lot of work in South Asia on Bengal as well as other places, some of which you refer to, some of which is from outside of South Asia, cultures of empire type stuff, but mm -hmm. stuff on Bengal as well by mm -hmm. people like Robert Travers mm -hmm. or Tariq Ali or others. So I wanted to hear a little bit about how this work mm -hmm. perhaps forces us to reframe what we think about in terms of the timeline of colonialism, anti-colonialism, nationalism, agency, or mm -hmm. questions along these lines. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. That, this very interesting question. Again, I'm not sure I'll be able to answer it entirely to your satisfaction, but if, if, I, I'll try. Um, what you're asking about methodology, um, that for me is sort of um, the most difficult part in the sense that I, so again it's to do with one's own work and how one approaches one's work I think I'll try and answer it personally in that I've never been able to actually approach a body of material that I'm interested in working on with a pre-given um, theories or a notion that I like that argument and I want to try and apply that argument or that theory to this material. Um, I find that that doesn't help me to think through the material and in some sense, although um, it might sound a bit grandiose, it's, 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 it's good, I find, to let the material speak for itself in a, in, in a certain way. Of course, letting the material speak to, to you will always be premised on what you're reading parallelly uh, alongside, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 alongside the, the, the basic material that you're, that you're dealing with. So, so say say I were to answer with a concrete uh, example. So this 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 part that I was discussing just now about the the next chapter on the figure of the peasant or how the peasant was figured in um, uh, uh, the writings um, uh, by uh, uh, this this Hindu college um, uh, uh, ex student in in 1842. Uh, I found that to do that I had to wade through I don't know how many books on agrarian history which included um, sort of all of the classic um, sort of stuff on the left from right from Ranajit Guho right, right, right through uh, over there to the Cambridge history. so the quarrel between the Cambridge school and the and and the, the, the subaltern school so the Stokes and everything that came after so Travers very much belongs to, to, to that but basically Basically, what was interesting for me was that in the quarrel between those those two schools, what I could see was that although, of course, now bridges have been built between between the, the two schools. I mean, in the sense that um, there was this entire issue of modern Asian studies, where they sort of you know uh, uh, to which uh, uh, these historians all sort of uh, contributed, where they where they spoke of of sort of you know trying to trying to bridge the 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 the, the perceived sort of differences between between the way in which the two schools looked at. Um, uh, uh, things. 
my interest has been to look at I really do find and again I don't know whether that sounds presumptuous but I really do find that your research or what you're writing is predicated a lot on where you are at the moment or where you're writing from in the world. I found as a student in Oxford um, uh, or even when I go and spend a year in Oxford uh, as, as visiting, I find that I find that the vantage point it just becomes different um, because of the materials you access or because of the, I don't know whether it's because of the archive that you get from that end. Or I think it's a little more than that, really, because it's it's not entirely to do with the archive. I find I find that when I read these histories that that you're referring to, that that make these larger arguments, I find that they're predicated oftentimes on where the particular body of knowledge has been uh, sort of not just accessed but also written down but the look simply the location of the of the historian sometimes becomes important for me the subaltern school historians therefore are a great inspiration in that they are the people I think who actually managed to break free of, of that conundrum to a certain extent and actually treat materials in the local way that I'm, I'm talking about that, that I'm asking for except that so again so now methodologically I find that obviously I don't fit into the agrarian hist historians at all I'm not an agrarian historian so in the chapter on the peasant say not not in this chapter but say so I'm not an agrarian historian I'm not doing what they're doing I'm not looking at colonial policy revenue taxation blah 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 all of that which they've done in many many books um, uh, over there. I'm interested in the way in which the subaltern school historians have approached the, their, their material and that's, that, that's what I have an affinity to. But the subaltern school historians are not interested in, in what they think of as the elite classes. Whereas I am. I, 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 think, uh, I think that for me the interesting question is not what the condition of the peasant was directly in the manner in which both the groups have dealt, dealt with it so far but what was the position of the interlocutor the position of the man writing on the peasant so all these history all these historians themselves are of course city bred people who are sitting at their desks and writing <laughs> And and, and 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 to me the fact that they don't recognize that they had precursors in this group of people did they have were these people precursors I don't know I mean it's a question I'm trying to ask myself but if I thought of them as precursors then it is certainly a group that they have no interest in and that they have not written about for various ideological um, reasons um, so I find methodologically that 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 I have to create my own sort of, you know, way forward. And part of that way forward is to do with my training as a literary historian. Because even in this chapter to do with the, with the figure of the peasant, I found what I was following in the end was a strain of um, language, was, was, was the manner in which particular phrases were being used, the manner in which, uh, say, phrases like the sufferings of the lower classes or for the benefit of the masses or, 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 or actually just, just, just class difference, you know, the, the aristocracy are blah, 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 and, you know, the, the, the riots are the, 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 you know, the, the ones who suffer. So, so the entire chapter, in the end, I, I found what I did was actually trace the use of that language in um, various constituencies, why that language was occurring in the way it was, and 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 in the end construct a thesis so that I eventually call the paper that came out of it socialist thinking before socialism in Calcutta in 1846 <laughs> because it really is uh, if you so, you know if you look at the language itself it really is exact because in one point one of the uh, writers is saying the rich uh, you know, uh, the poor need to be protected from the rich. The rich create their own uh, laws and they are able to manipulate those laws to their own ends. The poor need to be protected. Now, if that isn't socialist language, I don't know what is. But of course, the Communist Manifesto is being written only two years after or, or a few years after. So, so, so this was of interest to me and I realized that I, I was interested in, in doing that perhaps because of my interest in language, um, which comes out of my interest in in, in literature so so yes I've, I've had to make up the methodol methodology as I've gone along and the, the larger abstractions again 
temperamentally I'm not interested in, in, in the larger abstraction which I find a lot of um, uh, historians and, and, and writers on history especially here um, more and more are, are, are so that post, post colonial moment of difference where you could actually you know look at um, uh, 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 these materials from say Bengal or anywhere or Chorichora for that instance in, in that in the, in that way to me I, and I may be wrong I'm, I'm you know um, uh, speculating here to me that moment seems to have closed again um, in a way uh, because no uh, again I, I may be wrong but but um, I found um, uh, sort of so, so, so the two uh, so this this chapter of, I, I'll just to, to demonstrate I sent this chapter to the general of Asian studies and modern Asian studies both venues at which I've published before uh, both venues at which I published before when I was quite much younger and with a lot of support from the editorial uh, uh, sort of apparatus at both these places. Um, this time round, both uh, 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 places said to me, General of Asian Studies just said that, you know, we really don't do so much of sort of, you know, South Asia anymore, which was corroborated to me by other scholars. They said, yes, the, the, the focus has changed. But the, but the editor at Modern Asian Studies was, was 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 the was, was had this wonderful um, reply in which he said he wasn't sure anybody but the Bengali Bhadrulok would be interested in reading a paper like this, and I said, oh, thank you for a response like that. I wasn't aware the Bengali Bhadrulok was still extinct, but I mean I thought it was extinct, but I'm glad to know you think it still exists. But but responses like that, and this was very puzzling to me because I would expect that you know after ten years in the field, it would be more easier, not not more more difficult. But it, I think it also has to do with, I, I may be wrong, I, I, a certain closing down. After the subaltern school, historians have, they're still allowed, of course, to do what they do because they are who they are. But I think as younger scholars, now more and more the demand is that you need to theorize, you need to make the larger uh, abstractions, you need to tell us where this comes from in world history, in capitalist history, in the history of, you know, how does this fit in? What is the. Yeah. You have to, un unless you do that, they're not, uh, our readers won't be interested, they say, unless you sort of, you know, and I'm not interested in giving you those answers. I, I want, uh, sort of, yeah. So on that, I think we should yes. sort of thank uh, uh, Rosinka and uh, for, 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 for the conversation which went far beyond your, <laughs> uh, the, the, the theme of your paper and went beyond that. Sure. And invite all of you, is there a reception? To a reception next show. Please join me in thanking Rosinka. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.